listening to Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and Theirs, a show that discusses internal and relational anxiety, how it blocks effective leadership, and how we can move through it to a greater health. And now your host, Steve Cuss. We're about halfway through the second season of this podcast. And before we get to our guest today, I'm just going to ask you to do us a favor. This will take about 30 seconds or so. But it would help us a lot spread the word if you'd be willing to take one of the episodes that's meant a lot to you and just post it on your social media. You can retweet, you can put it on Facebook or Instagram, but that'll help spread the word of what we're doing, particularly if you know somebody or a group of people that you think would really benefit from the material on a podcast. Go ahead and send it to them. Another option that would help us out is if you might be willing to leave a a written review on iTunes. It takes about 30 seconds and actually, believe it or not, does also spread the word for us. We'd really appreciate that. All right. Today's guest is Nate Pyle. Nate's the lead pastor at Christ Community Church in Fishers, Indiana. He's also written a couple of books. His second book coming out this week uh, called More Than You Can Handle, When Life's Overwhelming Pain Meets God's Overwhelming Grace. And one of the reasons I love this book is because Nate has lived what he's writing about, and he also has the unique challenge as a leader of figuring out when to steward his own pain for people and uh, when to keep it from his people for their sake. We get into that, we get into leadership anxiety, we get into family systems, but I started by asking Nate about an early failure experience he had when he was fired as a youth minister in his first church. Let's take a listen to what Nate has to say. Yeah, so uh, I graduated from uh, college and then became a young, what they call a Young Life Church partner. So uh, the church actually hired me and then it kind of contracted me out with Young Life and did. Uh, and so I worked in the schools doing Young Life stuff. So I, was, I had a dual role there with, with the church and with Young Life. I did that for about four and a half years. Um, and over the course of that time, just some natural transitions happened within the life of the church. Uh, the senior pastor who I initially was hired under took a call to work with a missions organization that he had already been highly involved with. And then uh, about six, nine months later, the associate pastor who uh, I had been working with took a call to be a senior pastor at another church. And so the church was left without uh, a senior pastor and associate pastor for about a year and a half. We went through a search process looking for just the senior pastor. And uh, that, that was a really anxiety producing time for the congregation. They actually narrowed down to one pastor and then the pastor was choosing between us and another congregation and ended up going with the other congregation, which put the search team all the way back to the beginning. So there was a lot of anxiety in the, in the congregational system. And uh, in the meantime, so I was 25 years old at that time and, uh, and they, uh, had me doing all kinds of stuff. So I was doing the youth ministry stuff. I was chairman of the Christian Edge Council. I was helping to be a liturgist almost every single week. I was preaching every six weeks. I was doing Young Life. I was going to seminary. By the way, I was married. Like I just, I, I was doing it all. And I thought I could do it all. So I got this young arrogance that started just to build within me. And as the search team narrowed down on a, on a, on a, on a, on a candidate, uh, they, they came to me and they said, hey, would you take a look at this guy and tell us what your thoughts were? And this is where it all starts to go downhill. So I looked over his resume and stuff and I listened to one of his sermons and 25-year-old punk me, I said, when they came back to me and said, so what, do you, what do you think about him? I said, yeah, I don't think you should hire him. And they said, uh, why not? And I said, because I can preach better than him. <laughs> so that was... <laughs> Uh, that was the beginning of the end. They ended up hiring him and, uh, and for a number of reasons, it didn't work. Part of it was my arrogance. Part of it was he and I had a very different philosophy of ministry. Um, mine was much more relational based coming out of young life. And so I spent a lot of time out of the church, you know, in kids' homes, at the schools, different sporting events and, and things like that. Um, and, and he was uncomfortable with that and wanted me to keep track of all my, uh, you know, what I was doing and where my hours were being spent and how it was going to benefit the ministry and all of that sort of stuff. And, uh, and, and I, again, young punk, a little bit of a rebellious streak, a little bit of frustration being micromanaged in that way. It, it was oil and water. And so, uh, I ended up telling the, the, the church, uh, in, in, in October that, I felt like it was time for me to be done, but I wanted to finish the end of the year uh, through a whole lot of back and forth and meetings with volunteers and meeting with teachers. Uh, they, 
initially asked, they said that they were considering whether or not I should be done in January. I said, I don't like that, but that's fine. I understand it. They told me then that they wanted to, uh, wanted me to stay on. So this was in December. They asked me to stay on, uh, till the end of the school year, which was great. And then two weeks later I was let go. And, uh, oh, man. yeah, so some things happened internally. Some people found out about that decision who, who didn't, who weren't on board with that. And, uh, yeah. So anyways, I was let go two weeks later. So that, that, <laughs> that's kind of the story. So I like, I absolutely have an, have, have a, have ownership and responsibility for some of what happened. And now, golly, what is that? You know, 12, 13 years later, looking back on it, I can see that. But in the time it was, it was extremely painful. How long was the period uh, where the church was looking for a new lead pastor, that interim period? Yeah. The interim period, it was 18 plus months. Yeah. Yeah. That's a long time. And I'd like to hear from you on that dynamic when a church is oriented so much around a lead pastor. Mm Mm-hmm the other staff and key volunteers who feel as invested in the church as the lead pastor does get this very rude awakening that they're not as important, right? Like that's kind of what you're explaining too. To tell me a bit about that. Part of what boosted my ego and gave me a lot of confidence was that in that interim period was the reliance that people had on me and the confidence that they expressed in me. You know, here I am 25 years old, haven't even gone through seminary and, uh, they're asking me to preach every sing, you know, six times or, or once, once every six weeks. And so uh, that was a, that was a huge vote of affirmation for me. And I got a lot of positive feedback from that from folks. And so that was both really great, but it also kind of boosted that ego, you know, and like I said, I was doing, filling all these other roles in the congregation. I was even doing some pastoral care. I remember one instance where an older gentleman, he older than my parents, uh, he started, he was dating this girl and he called me up one day and was like, tell me why I shouldn't move in with my girlfriend, you know? And so here he is, this older gentleman by 30 some years older than me is coming to me for pastoral care. And so I, 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 that felt great. That was, that was wonderful. But then the shift that happened when the new guy showed up and all of a sudden it was, yeah, great. You're you're here, Nate, but now it's him and it's his vision and it's what he wants to implement. And, you know, if there's this conflict between you and him, we're actually going to take his side, you know, type of thing. And so I felt very brushed aside um, and, and taken advantage of in some in some regards. Like I did all of this for the last 18 months. And now all of a sudden you're going to treat me like this because the new guy comes on and doesn't like the way that I've been doing things. So, yeah, that was really, really hard. I, I Every leader I know and respect has at one point in their life, at least at one point, been significantly burned by the church. Yeah. I, I think it's hard not to. It's when you're invested in it and, and, and yeah, I, I have the same thing. Like I, every leader I know has some story where they've been burned. And the question that I've been asking those leaders is like, how do you, how, how did you not become bitter? How did you not become cynical? Yeah. And one of the moves you made uh, is learning your own complicity in it, which to me is part of the healing is when you see the things that you did, like it it could be true that you were burned, but it's also true that you did some burning or you didn't show up as well as you could have. I'm not saying you, Nate, I'm saying anyone, but yeah, no. And and that's absolutely true is, so I'm a, I don't know how many, how much you're familiar with or your listeners are, but the Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram three. So I'm very much about uh, looking good, being perceived as successful. And that's all very, very important for me, uh, which means that I have a tendency not to be introspective. Um, And so a huge part of my learning process for the next two years was looking back and not placing the blame on somebody else so that I look good, but was actually willing to say, what part did I have in this? And that was, that was not only good for my own personal healing in regards to that particular situation, but it actually set me up really well for leadership in the future. Yeah. And if I recall, you have a four wing, right? So this, uh, this desire to be exceptional or unique. Yep. Yeah, no one's like me. I, I'm 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 the I, I'm really good at what I do, and nobody else is like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so even more of a rude awakening when a church says, "Okay, you can move along." Yeah, yeah, it really was. It was it was a um, it, it it was a rude awakening. It was a how how can you cast me aside? 
like I'm so unique and I bring so much to the table and you can just disregard me. Like everything's going to fall apart. Like I, 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 in my most prideful moments in soon after it happened was waiting for the youth group to fall apart, waiting for the church to experience this massive vacuum of where Nate used to be and then to come crumble, you know, for it to come crumbling down and for them to come crawling back and it never happened. Right. Uh, some of the kids who I had really strong relationships were hurt. And even to this day, I still have relationships with a lot of those now young adults. And we talk about that experience, uh, but the youth group carried on, you know, and it, it, it's still going. It's quite strong. The church is, is, is fine. And in many ways is doing well. So yeah, I overinflated my own sense of worth there. Yeah, that's great. Tell, tell us about the journey um, from feeling so important to the church to realizing that the church is actually bigger than you. You, the way you're saying that now, you describe that as almost a journey of freedom, not a journey of um, pain. I mean, obviously, there's pain in it. Yeah, but yeah. There, there is something freeing for a, a three or a, a someone who feels extremely unique. There's something very freeing about realizing, actually, I'm not that big a deal. <laughs> I don't know that I'd label that as freeing, but it absolutely is something that I've I've learned, and it's been helpful to counter those natural tendencies that I have as a three. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, there is a sense of freedom in terms of well, in two things, I think. One, to recognize that the things that I'm doing aren't necessarily as important. Like I'm not as essential to the system. I'm not as essential to the church as a whole. And so whether I succeed or whether I fail, like those are important things and I want to work hard to them, but ultimately it isn't going to mean that the church is going to rise or fall on me. Right. And so there's a sense of freedom within that of, I'm going to continue to do the best work that I can do, recognizing that my impact isn't quite as large as I think that it is. Uh, the other piece of that is uh, what you were talking about of, you know, um, that there's, there, there's a, there's a, there's an ability that I have to empower people now because I know that despite the fact that I think I know what is right for the church or how to do things or that I can be the best one to do these, you know, certain activities. So whether that be preaching or vision casting or anything like that, uh, which is where my skill set really is, is, um, uh, I, I don't have to be the one to do that. Like I can actually empower other leaders and they may do it differently. They may, they may not be, uh, say it quite the way that I would say it or want them to say it, but that doesn't mean that things are going to fail, right? The church is, is, it's bigger than me. And so it doesn't require me. And so I can step out of the way and let others lead. Tell us about, uh, the journey from the pressure of being a youth minister to the pressure of being a lead pastor. You know, they're they're different because they're coming from different places, but I think there's also a, a, a commonality to them. So with the, being a youth pastor, I felt the pressure actually from the from parents a lot. There's this sense of anxiety that their student wouldn't come to faith or wouldn't stay connected to the church. And so this pressure was placed on me as the youth pastor to be the one to ensure that their students stayed connected, right? And so there's a certain anxiety that was bubbling under the surface of, uh, uh, what is my student going to do? And so really felt that pressure from, from parents uh, to make youth group something that kids would want to come to or to make sure that their kids were connected or make sure their kids were growing. Uh, in the same way with a senior pastor, being a senior pastor now, um, there's, there's, a, there's that level of anxiety about our, the church and everything like that, but it's not this indirect from like parents towards an anxiety about my kids, but it's very much so anxiety about me. And so as I lead change in the church, I think of, you know, doing adaptive work in, in the church, continuing to adapt to the changing culture around us and the context that we're in and learning how to do ministry and all of that. People's anxiety is, are you still going to care for me? You know, as we talk about reaching out, as we talk about being missional, as we talk about um, uh, sending people out of the church and, you know, to do work in the community and programs change and the church looks and feels different. Uh, are you still going to meet my needs? Um, and so that, that's, the, that's the pressure. That's the anxiety that I feel as being in an established congregation. I think that that's a, that's a difference between an established and maybe a church plant. I think a church plant has that missional outward focus that's woven into the DNA. Our church is 
uh, 40 years old ish. And so uh, being a little bit more established and doing some of this more revitalization and changing of direction is causing this anxiety of you're taking the church in a different direction, but am I still going to, am I still going to have a place? Are you still going to care for me? Um, are my needs going to be met? So that, that, I don't know that that gets at your question directly, but th that's some of the pressure that I feel and, and the concerns that I experience from people. It does. I I had a similar journey. Uh, I, I was at a large church through a lead tr pastor transition, and I had a similar burning experience, although in this particular case, the new lead pastor was a fantastic human being. He, he was really good. But through the process, I had uh, some burning. And then when I became a lead pastor, I had a whole different outlook on his role than mm -hmm. when I was working there. You know, it just it's like, oh, man, this chair is a different chair. Yeah, the it, chair I sat in before. It is. And and I've actually, you know, uh, for a long time harbored, I, I wouldn't say enmity or uh, hatred towards the, the senior pastor under whom I was fired, uh, but definitely some bitterness and kind of looked down my nose at him like, oh, I would have done that differently. And, and I still think I would have done a lot of things differently, but I have a lot of compassion towards him. And actually, uh, n not to, 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 uh, uh, belittle him or anything like that. I actually think he was thrust into a difficult situation and, and the church made uh, made a, ch a choice that, that was uh, really harmful for him, that they, they they chose somebody who they didn't set him up to succeed either. And so I have a lot of compassion towards him. And, and look back at it and see some of the dynamics in the church that uh, I, I didn't have words for, I didn't have the education in terms of family systems and just even leadership experience to see some of those dynamics at work. Like no, that was that was actually he was in a really difficult situation as well, and uh, I just happened to be the 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 point of triangulation for the outlet of a lot of other anxiety. Yeah, so you've hinted at family systems theory. I know that you're friends with Jim Harrington. Uh, Jim was just a guest on the show a couple of weeks ago. So that journey of being fired as a youth minister through seminary to now being a lead pastor, you did encounter Jim and family systems theory. Just give us uh, one or two tools or things you learned that you thought were really helpful. Yeah, I, I, when it comes to family systems theory, the thing that I have really gleaned a lot from is this idea of anxiety in the system and how anxiety spreads and the 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 natural ways in which anxiety shows up within individual relationships, but then also within the, fam the, the, the congregation or the system as a whole, that there's some very predictable outcomes. So whether we're talking about distancing or triangulation or conflict or this hurting instinct or blame displacement, you know, all of those different things that come up in the family system series, learning about those has been really helpful for me as a leader because it's, it's kept me from, blaming individuals and and making them to be the problem rather it's allowed me to say i see the effects of anxiety going on anxiety is a natural result of change how can we address that anxiety in a way that uh uh, it, it actually, you know, helps people feel more. So how, how do I become a less anxious presence, manage that anxiety within the system so that we can actually talk about what's really going on here. Right. So, so the, you know, the, the example we had a few years ago when I first arrived at the church here, uh, on the second Sunday of every month, we had a brunch after the worship service. They've been doing that for years. It was a huge tradition and everybody loved it. And over the course of a number of years, the attendance at it dropped off. It was the same people. Guests weren't coming to it. Then we moved from our old sanctuary into a new worship space. And that new worship space was where the brunch used to happen. And so it became really difficult to happen both. And so we were, we were going to eliminate brunch, right? And there was a lot of anxiety around that. And, you know, there was some triangulation that was happening. There was some blame that was going around all of that. And for me to recognize, it's not these people who are raising the concern, but rather it's the overall change that's happening in the church and giving space for people to release that anxiety by, by creating feedback loops, right? So let's have a meeting after church so you can express that anxiety to me and we can hear about it and make some, make some adjustments. And then for me, just to show up as a less anxious presence and go, okay, I'm not going to make these people the enemy. I, I, I'm going to recognize that this is what anxiety does. Okay. Yeah. So you made it less personal. Um, 
Okay, you've you've re- referenced two things. One of which we've never covered on the podcast. That was oh, tri- okay. No, this is great. Uh, triangulation, but also the what we do reference a lot is uh, you becoming a less anxious presence. Let's let's take them one at a time. Would you just explain to people what triangulation is? Yeah, triangulation is so if let's just say Steve and I right now are having some sort of conflict and it's creating anxiety in in me, right? I, I'm feeling anxious about it. I'm feeling upset at Steve, whatever. Rather than talking to Steve, I'm going to talk to a third person about Steve and about the situation, trying to get them on my side. So that's one way that triangulation could work. Another one could be like Steve and I are having a conflict about, let's say, uh, um, or, or there's just some anxiety in our relationship because we have a different vision for, you know, how this podcast should go. Well, suddenly I'm going to bring up something completely different and say, like, if we just fix that thing, right, if we if we actually had this conversation over here, then then this would then then the anxiety between Steve and I would just go away or this other issue would be solved. Right. So a lot of times in church, uh, there's a it could look like uh as the church begins to try to reach out to other people, maybe they begin to do different kinds of worship, right? And so all of a sudden there's this huge blow up over drums. Well, it's not really about drums. It's about this change in direction of the church. So that could be another, you're triangulating in this third thing to sort of relieve anxiety by being able to not focus on the real issue. So uh, that's Yeah, that's great. We could also be triangling by you and I agreeing and ganging up right now against somebody who's not here. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, so that's, that's a very typical way that anxiety plays itself out. And, and, you know, within a larger congregational system that can take the place where it can begin hurting, right? So all of a sudden you get couple of different groups and now they're triangulating against each other and against other things. And then, you know, that's I think where power plays come out and it's, it's, it can be a really uh, tricky leadership position, leadership situation. But again, it's just recognizing like, this is what anxiety does. And so how do we manage that? I think that's a good catch that, that triangulation is the technical term, but it can involve dozens of people. It's not always just three people. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. This to me is a key to what we do on this podcast. You said before you step into this meeting, you manage yourself. You work on becoming a non-anxious presence. What do you do, Nate, that's helpful to help you de-escalate your own anxiety? I think it's important to recognize that anxiety is contagious, right? So if if the system of the church is anxious, there is no way that it's not going to affect me. That anxiety is going to spill over to me. And so over the years, I've learned how to recognize the signs of that within myself, um, and so learn what it feels like in my body. Um, and so for me, uh, my hands get a little sweaty. I can feel it down in my gut. It feels very similar to when I want to, or, or when I'm about to get up and, and to speak in front of people. It feels very similar to that. Um, and then my tendency is I really want to talk about it with a lot of people. I need to process it. And so th- that's not bad. That's, uh, that's fine. The way that I do it, though, is I try to find folks who are not a part of my congregational system. So I'm not taking that anxiety of the congregation, absorbing it into myself, and then spilling it back into the congregation by having conversations with deacons or elders or other influential leaders and trying to get them on my side. So now I'm triangulating, right? So what I try to do is have a, a counter system or a place where I can dump that anxiety. So uh, a coach is a great way to do this, where when an anxious situation comes up, dumping that, you know, into the coach, um, some meditative practices. So journaling some things in terms of this is what I'm feeling. This is the result that I'm hoping for. These are my values that I want to hold on to in the midst of these conversations. These are the, these are how I want to view the folks that right now are maybe the, they're the ones who are the, the acute or uh, they're, they're the manifestation of the anxiety within the system, right? This is how I want to treat them. How do I respond to them? And so trying to doing journaling exercises like that moves me away from my emotional response and pushes me towards the rational so that I can be very clear about what my values are and then hold on to those in the midst of the conversation. Um, so those are some of the, those are just a couple of things that I do to try to manage my anxiety um, in, the, in, in the midst of difficult situations. Yeah, I've run into people uh, when I've done coaching or on this podcast, and they'll say something like, you know, I'm not very anxious because I don't worry. They think that the only anxious response is worry. Right. What would be some other evidences that someone's anxious? Yeah, I, th- I think uh, uh, for a leader, um, we let go of our values, right? So, so if you say, uh, I want to be a leader who listens to the concerns of others, 
and we find ourselves stopping. We're no longer listening and we're shutting things, conversations down. Um, we, or we aren't even allowing certain conversations to be had, right? Uh, we've now let go of that value of wanting to be a leader who listens to others. I think that is a, anytime we're giving up a value is a sign that we are operating from an anxious perspective. Um, that's great. I, I, th- that, that's a big one for me. I also notice it when I become really manipulative and, and not manipulative in the, like in, in a, in an overt way, but manipulative is in using rhetoric to get people to see things from my perspective, because I believe it's the only way to see that. Um, and, and again, that part of my values to one of my values is that I don't see the whole picture and I need the input of others to get it. And the minute I start going, well, uh, actually I see this really clearly and y'all should do it my way. That tells me that I'm in a, in a, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm feeling anxious and I need to figure out how to process that. Uh, Nate, you're about to actually, as of the publication of this podcast, you've released your second book. All right, yeah. Would you, would you tell us about it? Yeah, so uh, my second book is called uh, "More Than You Can Handle: When Life's Overwhelming Pain Meets God's Overcoming Grace," and uh, it's a story. Well, it's not really a story, but it, it kind of is. Uh, my wife and I, we went through a period where we had some infertility struggles. We had an ectopic pregnancy. Um, there was some anxiety in terms of the, the clinical anxiety, not, not, not the kind that we've been talking about here, but then more of the clim- chem- uh, clinical anxiety uh, in our family um, and then an adoption process. So over a course of like three and a half years, all this was going on. And it was just a really difficult and trying period as we kept process- having to walk through one one experience after another that just weighed us down and, and was extremely difficult. And so the book follows that narrative arc, but then really, and, but then also includes stories of me uh, walking through people uh, experiences in my congregation, you know, so uh, you know, a, a husband and wife who over the course of two years lost their two adult sons um, and I officiated their funerals, uh, a woman who died of cancer, you know, different situations like that. Um, and, and, and really walk through the questions that people ask when they when they get into those times of suffering. You know, uh, not just where is God, but what is God doing? And did I do something to deserve this? And um, will this, is God going to do anything good with this? So I try to be really honest about that by sharing our story and the questions that it forced, that it caused me to ask as a pastor. Um and, and just, I, I don't try to offer a whole lot of explanations for those things, but just to give people an insight of this, this is what it was like for us to walk through these experiences. These are the questions that are raised. And this is, this is what I discovered. This is what God revealed to me in the midst of our process. And hopefully that that offers something to, to the readers. Mm, so, that's great. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have a link to the book in the uh, podcast, uh, podcast uh, explanation. But w- one of the things that strikes me as I'm listening to you, there are a lot of leaders that I know that really struggle to integrate their own pain into their leadership. Mm -hmm. And obviously you and your wife had your own journey of pain while you're leading both people in pain and people who are not in pain in your church. Some some leaders, I've been in churches where the congregation members will say, is it okay to be okay in this church or do I always have to be struggling? You know, some leaders take that extreme where they're so concerned to reach people who are struggling that they don't make room for people who are not. Right. And then, then of course, there's this other extreme where a leader simply doesn't know how to connect their own humanity to their leadership. Yeah. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think that's great on both fronts. Um, and I do think that there, there is a, you know, there's a ditch on both sides of the road, as you were just describing, you either set it up so that the church, it doesn't feel safe to struggle and to question and to suffer. And then there's the other side where that doesn't feel safe to say like, actually, I'm in a really good place right now. And so for us, what that looked like was, um, what was being very authentic about where we were. And, and when I say authentic, I don't mean full disclosure, right? So to, to, um, to be honest about 
honest with the fact that we were struggling, but maybe not fully disclosing all the questions we were asking at the particular moment. Um, so when we went through the ectopic pregnancy, you know, we shared, we had an ectopic pregnancy. I missed a Sunday because it, you know, my, we had to take my wife into the emergency room on a Saturday night. So I missed the next day. The congregation was great. Um, I, I think I actually took two Sundays off and the second Sunday we just went to church and people were, were wonderful in terms of how they responded to us by both, being caring and inquisitive, but also by giving us the appropriate amount of space and, 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 you know, the ministry of meals is always wonderful. And so all, all of that was, was wonderful. But what I didn't share with them was also the questions that I had, right. I didn't share as it was happening that three days after the ectopic pregnancy, we had to end a pregnancy that I was walking through the woods, shaking my fists at God, saying to God, you tell us that you knit us together in our mother's womb and this child didn't make it into the womb. That's on you. Like I didn't, I didn't share that then. Um, and so I think as leaders, we have to figure out what's the healthy balance to be authentic in terms of, I'm going to share where you, where we are, but I'm not going to fully disclose. So when my wife was going through the, the anxiety and the panic attacks and insomnia, I pulled my elders in one Sunday morning and said, this is where, this is what's going on. This is what I I'm asking for, for you. Um, and, and being very clear about what I needed um, from from my from my elders and my leaders, um, and then also very clear about what they could expect from me for the next couple of weeks and what we would do moving forward. Um, at the same time, I asked them, you know, as the, the, this needs to stay in this room for right now. And, and again, we didn't share that with the entire congregation. We shared some of the things, you know, uh, I, it was right around Christmas time, and so uh, on the third Sunday of Advent, it's God at Sunday or the Joy Sunday, right? And so I got up and. Like I wasn't feeling joy and I was very honest about that. I was very honest with the congregation about why I, uh, that I wasn't feeling joy, but also that I was going to choose defiantly to hope in joy. Right. And, and so, but I didn't give them the, like, here's the circumstances surrounding this. Right. So again, trying to find this line and then also to be authentic, not just about when we're struggling, but to be authentic about the redemption that's happening, right? So again, this gets to that second point where you want to actually say to people, like, it's okay to come out of it and it's okay to rejoice that you're out of it and you're in this good space. And so to, we also shared that um, in, in different ways. And so, yeah, I think that that's a really tenuous, like, like I said, it's a tightrope, but finding that balance really resides around what does it look like to be authentic without having to give full disclosure? I think that that's, a, that's been a helpful mantra for me. It also sounds, if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like there are details you share afterwards, like after the heat of the situation is over, you might say, you know, I did walk through the woods and shake my fist. You're just not shaking your fist on Saturday and sharing it on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. I think it's Nadia Bowles Weber who says that we uh, we can lead from or share from our scars, but not from our wounds, yeah, right? Yeah. Which I think I, I find that to be it's really, helpful. really helpful. Yeah. In terms of, yeah, I've got scars and I can show you my scars, but I'm not going to like show you my gaping wounds right now because I don't know what's what's coming out of those wounds. I and yeah, I just think that that can be particularly unhelpful as a leader. I think there's a time for that, but I, that's where I think you need to have wise counsel around you to help you learn and discern which ones, which wounds do I maybe share and which ones do I not. The other thing you pointed out that I, I thought was really helpful is that you did avail yourself of the care of your congregation. You're not a leader that thinks that care is only one way. There is a two way care. Yeah, I firmly believe that. I mean, uh, uh, I think that sometimes we as uh, as pastors or leaders within congregations can separate ourselves. So sometimes I hear pastors talk about their congregation and it's like the church or them. Like I hear this sort of third person language towards their congregation. And I very much yeah. try to use the like we and us language. Uh, yeah. and, and I I am I have a unique uh, role that is set apart within my congregation. And yet I am absolutely a part of my congregation and these yeah. are my people. And that's been a shift that, you know, you mentioned Jim Harrington a couple of weeks ago that he helped me with. So when I arrived at this congr at this church, uh, my wife and I were very much like, this will be three to five years. It'll be a great church to be at for three to five years. And then we'll move on to the next one. Then it'll be bigger and better. And that's, you know, cause the, the sort of climbing the corporate ladder of the church and, uh, and Jim really challenged me with like, what does it look like to be at a place for 10, 15, 20 years and see yourself not just as, as a pastor, but as a, as a part of this community and not just to yeah. see yourself as a pastor of the church, but also to see yourself as a pastor of a community. And that, that mental model shift was 
it, it was big for me and it still is something that I challenge that, that I'm challenged by because as a three, man, I'd like to go to a bigger church and, and for my own, my own ego. Um, but, but to be here and to see these as my people and to, to journey with them over a long period of time has been something that's been, I think, uh, uh it's done a beautiful work in the congregation, but more so in me. I love that. Yeah. That, there was an era of church conferences where I went to the church conference and I just got really frustrated because the person on stage who's inevitably a pastor somewhere is talking about his congregation. And I'm so, sad to say it was always a guy who was doing the talking yeah. as if um, he's not the same species. Like he was, dero- yeah, yeah. you know, you know, those people. And, and I kept thinking you are, you are as hundred percent sheep as they are. You know, like we're all, totally. if you, if you cut me and send my blood to the DNA, I'm sheep, just like my <laughs> congregation, you know what I mean? But I, yeah, I do think as leaders, we tend to believe we're, a different species than the very people as if we don't have exactly the same foibles and sins and challenges. And therefore what I love about what you're saying is, is the freedom of letting people in your congregation care for you Mm -hmm. like a true body of Christ experience. That's what I'm hearing at least. Yeah. That's, uh, and that's the way that I treat, uh, that's why I feel like this congregation has treated both myself and my wife. They see us. Yes. You're our pastor and we love you because of that, but you're also Nate and you're also Sarah and we love you for that as well. And so when you're struggling, we're going to, we're going to bring meals to your house and, and we're going to figure out ways that we can come alongside of you and support you and pray for you. And it's just, it's been wonderful. And, and, and frankly, it's made me like it's one of those things where I, as a pastor, again, it's like, why would I want to leave? Like, where else am I going to find this? And we've cultivated this and we've built these relationships. And now it's just part of the the ethos and the DNA of the congregation. As a pastor, I'm kind of selfish and, and, and jealous of that. Like, I don't want to give it up. <laughs> Uh, let's move to a set of questions that I ask every guest. And the first one you've already tackled. So I'm going to ask it and okay. and I'll hear it again, but we can probably move on. Uh, that is anxiety always starts in the body, uh, either a spinning mind, a racing heart or a tightening gut. You've talked about how for you it's in your gut. Yeah, I think what would be helpful for our listeners is as people are trying to figure out where it starts for them is if you could give us a little more of how you know when you're anxious physiologically. For me, it's in my gut, and I know that anxiety that I feel before I get up in front of a, a group of people and speak. Particularly, I mean, I still have it on Sunday mornings, even after you know almost eleven years of preaching forty-five times a year. Um, but I definitely have it when I go speak in front of other groups of people that I'm not as familiar with, and that it, it's almost identical to that. So we even had we this past December we had a congregational meeting and it got a little heated at one point, and I felt that tightening of my gut just like I do before stage. And I know I, I and and so now I've got it because I've learned to look for it and to 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 recognize the feeling of it, to say okay I'm anxious. How do I want to respond out of this anxiety? So asking questions, keeping my voice calm, um, being curious, my values. Again, all that, I feel like so much of how we respond to anxiety is work that we've done preparing for it. In the midst of an anxious situation, we can't respond as, like we don't respond from our best place if we haven't done some pre-work to it. So for me, recognizing those signs have been, has been very, very um, helpful. And like I said, it happens in my gut and and. And, and, and I say one other thing is that there's a narrowing of vision. When all of a sudden I lose my peripheral vision, I also know that I'm starting to get anxious. Um, there's, a, there's a tightening down that happens. So it's in my gut and then what I see. I, I think another source of leadership anxiety is when a leader uh, believes they need something in any given moment that they don't actually need. So in my case, I'm also an Enneagram three with a four wing, by the way. So with oh, there you go. basically right. brothers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for me, I always need to be impressive. I need to look mm-hmm. smart, but I don't actually need that. I just believe the lie that I need that. Could you name a couple of needs that you have that generate anxiety? Yeah. Uh, uh, very similar to that. I, I need to look, I, I need to look like I'm in control, right? I need, or I need to be in control. Sometimes I need to have the answers, um, and that there, there, there is that especially unique, unique thing of uh, uh, I need to perform well. 
and it's really it's really interesting like when i do congregational meetings or even sermons on sundays and stuff when i'm not in a good place it's there's a performative aspect to it. i need to perform well and i need to be perceived as someone who did whatever task that i'm doing i need to do that well you've also alluded to this quite a bit but um i think the other challenge of leadership anxiety is the capacity to forgive yourself when you make a leadership mistake and i'm not talking about a giant mm-hmm. moral thing or something where you should be fired or arrested um you've already shared very right. poignantly an early mistake my theory is we never actually grow out of making mistakes uh what's a more recent one you'd be willing to share with us there's been there's a particular individual within our congregation right now who he and i have different visions of things and have kind of been butting heads and um you know i i we were we get, we had this kind of back and forth and he ended up he, he said something to me and i responded in a text and i just said hey i wonder if at some point you'd be interested in hearing the impact of what's all been going on between us if you'd be willing to hear that and and he responded with with a text of yeah i think that'd be good for me 3 months later i get a text from him saying are we still going to meet or not because this is part of the reason that i don't trust you because I failed to follow through on what I said I would do. I asked him, do you want to meet and hear about this? He said, yes, balls now in my court. And I failed on that. Um, And so even though this was an individual for whom we had some conflict and all of that, and, and, and there were some things that I think that he needed to own, what I needed to do in that moment was not point the finger at him and hold up everything that I think needed, he needed to be owned. What I needed to do is actually meet with him and own my mistake. And my mistake was I failed to keep my word and set up a meeting for you and I to have a conversation. And so that, I mean, that, that was as recently as this, this past December. So yeah, I think, I think that's what I'm, yeah, that's where I still see my complicitness. And, and that, I mean, quite honestly, that was an anxious response. I asked him if he wanted to meet and do this and I didn't want to actually have that conversation with him. Like he called my bluff and then I had, yeah, you were trying to be the bigger man. Right. I totally, totally. And, and then he called my bluff and I've got to show up and do it. And I didn't want to, which, you know, again, distance is a, an anxious response where we create distance in our relationships with people. And so, uh, and I, and I had to own that. So I, I, I I truly believe that, yeah, as leaders, we're going to have lots of those kinds of mistakes and they're real easy to brush those things off. But in some ways, I think those are the widow, widow's mites of leadership, right? The small offerings that we do that actually have huge value in the economy of, of, of God's kingdom. I, I, think, um, I think leaders are often the last to know that they're anxious or that they need help. So these next two questions are really about... Um, tapping into the source of life and and peace. So Nate, um, in your life, when do you feel most fully loved? No, this is kind of a sad answer, uh, but I think it's the truth. Uh, For me, I I tend to be a pretty high capacity person in terms of being able to take on a lot um, and and do a lot and feel like I should be doing a lot. And so I, I can run pretty hard and take on a lot of different things. And usually... I don't ask for what I need or share what's really going on until I hit a point, you know, I hit my capacities limit, whether that's an emotional capacity or just a time capacity and I can't do everything that's asking. And I get very frustrated. Um, and usually there's some bitterness in there and some maybe anger and resentment. Um, but in those moments where I get past that and I'm very honest and vulnerable with folks about here's where I'm struggling, here's um, what's not working for me anymore. And people respond with grace and they accept me and they don't shame me, you know, in terms of, well, you should be doing more. You should be doing all those things, but they're actually sitting there going like, Hey, we've been waiting for you to ask. (laughs) And the few times that there's been even a few times where I've done something like that. And somebody says, thank you. I actually feel like I know you better now. So for me, it's, it's, it's a continue those moments in which I can be vulnerable, which grates against, um, both my uh, my threeness of wanting to be perceived as someone who has it all together and looks good and, and is successful, uh, but then also grades against some of the um, the messages about masculinity and men that I've been taught and handed down over time. Right, uh, that men should be able to handle everything. That men should be rocks. Men should be in control. Men should be able to you know uh, deal with whatever situation comes their way. 
at the moments in which I've, I'm able to buck those narratives and enter into the actually as a human being, I have limitations and I have weaknesses and vulnerability and intimacy or things that I've been created for. Uh, those are when the moments when I feel most loved. What activities and places, and by places, I mean geographical places, what activities and places make you feel most fully human and alive? Uh, outdoors. Uh, so uh, I enjoy uh, anything, you know, a lot of hiking, fishing, camping, backpacking, all of that sort of stuff. And my wife and I have had a number of conversations over the last couple of years uh, about the, about this very question, both for both of us and real, realizing how our needs are very different on this. And so one of my needs is particularly in the fall when it's hunting season, all that, like getting out in the wood for, woods for extended periods of times is just rejuvenating for me. Um, you know, I, I love hunting, but part of it is just, it's good for me to sit in a tree stand for hours on end and do nothing but pay attention to the world around me, pay attention to me. Uh, there's just that that's huge for me. Um, and then I'm actually going on sabbatical this this summer, and one of the things I'm doing is taking my uh, my nine year old son backpacking in Yellowstone. And I used to do a lot of backpacking, but I actually haven't backpacked at all since I've been a pastor here. So it's been over ten years. And part of the way that I wrote my sabbatical proposal was that uh, I would take my son backpacking as a way to reignite that love and to get back out in the outdoors and cur- connect with that part that with that activity that feeds me so well, and then to bring my son along and kind of pass it on to him as well. So Nate, thanks a lot for your time. I think you shared a lot of great stuff. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us today. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram from the handle Steve Cusswords. You can also go to stevecusswords.com for more resources. This episode has been a production of Brendan Reed and Steve Cuss. 